conversations are built rather than asserted, at least that seemed to be my perspective. I think that experience, those two years, really taught me how to listen better. Listen and put my, myself in other people's shoes. A single moment of curiosity can lead to unexpected opportunities, some ending in a lifelong involvement with Japan. Our conversation partners all have a unique Japan journey to tell, one that's steeped in connections that have enriched their lives and altered them in deep, meaningful ways. Join us in their Japan journey and be inspired to embrace what's unfamiliar. Your next single moment of curiosity could lead you to possibilities you've never dreamed of. This is My Japan Journey. I'm Yuko Honda from the Japan Society of Boston. Welcome, Patricia, to our Japan Journey podcast. It is a great pleasure to have you here with us today. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Patricia McLaughlin is Professor of Government. And Mitsubishi Heavy Industries professor in Japanese studies at the University of Texas at Austin.、Um, Patricia, I always, always start with this question Where did your Japan journey start? Well, my Japan journey started、um, kind of later in life. A lot of people get very, very interested in Japan when they're in high school. And for me, it was mostly at the college level, although I had a bit of a subliminal influence when I was growing up. My father was a musician and he also ran a small piano shop. And the main piano that he sold was Kawaii Piano, of course, from Japan. And so I always recall in the background when my dad would come home from work. Praise for Japanese manufacturing ingenuity. He really liked the piano. It sold well. Sold well and I think it、uh, was a good business decision from him. So I kind of got introduced to it through the back door to Japan、um, at the dinner table.、Um, I also played the piano, and a lot of my friends who were playing piano or who were competing against me were Japanese、um, Canadians living in Vancouver. But it was really not until I got to the University of British Columbia as an undergrad and I started taking courses in Japan and I got the bug, so to speak. And then there was this one episode.、Um, it sounds a little silly in retrospect, but it was sort of a before and after moment for me in my quest for learning about Japan. One of my history professors invited his friend from downtown, as we would call it, a businessman who worked a lot with Japan in exports and imports, to give a talk to our class. And I still remember this man standing in front of me and telling us if you can combine knowledge of Japanese, the Japanese language, with a marketable degree, you stand to do really well in life. And at that point, I was in my second year,、uh, I was a sophomore. At that point, I thought I was going to go to law school. And I immediately thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Japanese. And so I started learning Japanese when I was 19 years old.、Um, and I never looked back. I never went to, to law school either, but、uh, Japan stayed in my life from that moment. The Japanese businessman, needless to say, never offered me a job at that point.、Um, he just got me thinking, got my wheels turning. And after that point, I decided that I would take more courses in Japan. I majored in political science and was in a program that enabled me to do a lot of really、uh, deep research on Japanese politics and history. And,、um, and then after I graduated, I decided, well, I'm just going to go to Japan. And I think it's important to remember, too, this is the 1980s, the mid 1980s. So by the time I graduated, the bubble economy had started. And everyone was abuzz about Japan. Japan then was what China is to us today、um, a fascinating country, a country that challenged our models of, of production and of the, so many facets of our daily life.、Um, and there was an intense curiosity about Japan in the media and also in our universities. And so I, I rode that wave. And so when I graduated, I decided I'm going to take some time off before I go to graduate school. And I ended up accepting a job with a YMCA in northern Hokkaido in a small city called Kitami, which is, I will say, closer to Vladivostok than it is to Tokyo. 
And I stayed for two years. And while I was there, I gave up on the law plan and decided I was going to go to graduate school and give it a try. So it was a great experience for me. So take us back to that day when you landed in Kitami. It was late August. And so, of course, it was warm. It was beautiful. In some ways, I felt like I was home because it was mountainous and green and lush and not terribly heavily populated. In fact, it was one of the most remote places I'd ever seen. And when I arrived, um, I had an, a wonderful experience. That just, I had a homestay for the first little while and I moved into my own apartment and I made good friends. Um, I uh, was an English teacher, so I didn't make as much opportunity for myself as I perhaps should have to speak Japanese because everybody wanted to speak English with me because I was the local English teacher. But there were no other foreigners, maybe one or two others that I met occasionally. All my friends, all my acquaintances were Japanese. And they were very welcoming and uh, they made it uh, just a fabulous experience. Share with us, there must have been some expectation before getting to Japan. Were they all true or were some things completely not true? Were there things that surprised you, not surprised you? Absolutely. Well, when I was learning about Japan, I was thinking, I read a lot of books. I talked to people who had been there. My professors were experts in Japan. So I was book learned in terms of Japan, I think you could say. So I thought I knew a lot. <laughs> but when I got there, I realized I still had a lot of learning to do. So um, I did experience a kind of culture shock. It was very subtle in many ways. So after the first two to three initial weeks of feeling welcome and getting used to uh, Northern Japan um, finally passed, and I was settling into the workaday culture and getting used to my job, that's when I really learned the subtleties of human interaction in Japan. That's when it started, and at first I felt like a fish out of water. So um, that old adage that Japan looks like the rest of the world on the surface, it looks like any other Western community, more or less, was certainly true, but the culture was different. And it took me a while to get used to it. Can you share with us when you say subtleties? I'm curious, what were these subtleties? Well, the things that I should have paid more attention to in Japanese class, but um, never really did. So I learned the hard way, for example, at least in the community where I lived at that time, and this is 1986 to 88, uh, it's really true that stereotype, the Japanese don't say no. It bluntly, but I did. I was learning how to be an assertive young woman. I was 22 years old and I would use the word no. And sometimes I would push back and was often frustrated that the response from my, whoever I was speaking to, whether it was my boss at the language school or other teachers, when I would assert myself, uh, I did not get a direct response in reply. And, and that was hard. It took me a while to figure out. In fact, one very kind teacher took me aside and said, you, know, you got to get used to this. This is not how we do things here. And you're coming across as kind of aggressive, which was funny because in Canada, we're supposed to be less aggressive than Americans. But I was still too much so for, for my Japanese uh, colleagues. So that, that was one example. Direct communication. It was more subtle. Um, uh, and more collaborative conversations in Japan. Conversations are built rather than asserted. Um, at least that seemed to be my, my, my perspective. I think that experience, those two years, really taught me how to listen better. Listen and put my, myself in other people's shoes. Um, I didn't always get it right, but that was a good learning experience for me. Did you experience any other parts of Japan while you were there? I did. Since I was working on the academic school year, um, teaching was very light during the summer and there was a long break at um, uh, around New Year's. And so I had a chance to travel all around Japan. And I actually met with friends or other colleagues 
uh, who also worked for YMCA's in other parts of the country. Friends in Kitami took me to Hot Springs, Akan National Park, Lake Akan, um, the Shiretoko Peninsula, beautiful parts of Hokkaido. And I went as far south as Hiroshima as a result of this network. So yes, I had a chance to travel through Japan through those two years. And also outside of Japan, I went to Hong Kong and Taiwan and South Korea. A um, little venture into China and Thailand. So that was an exciting time for me. So take us, this two-year end, you travel through Japan yeah. and through a lot of Asia. I am going to assume you came back to British Columbia? Just long enough to unpack my suitcases and repack them because about three weeks after I got back to Vancouver, I headed off to graduate school. So while I was in Kitami, um, I gained admission to Columbia University. So right after that, I started my graduate work. At that point, have you already decided that Japan is going to be a part of your academic career? Yes, yes. And again, this is Japan was so fascinating for different reasons today than, than perhaps today. Um, the economy was going gangbusters. The bubble economy was in going full force. Uh, the major shifts in Japan's global presence and its financial power. So I was fascinated in the middle of all of this to watch the economy growing and challenging that of the United States. And uh, I really did want to know why. So what was driving this movement by Japan? Now, I understand that you did a big research on the Japanese postal system. That's right. I have to admit, yeah. not a lot of people study the Japanese postal system. I mean, they do right. study the Japanese government and politics or women or history. By the way, I did a little of that. My first project as a PhD student and then my first book was on the Japanese consumer movement. And that was led by shufuden, women, women's groups and housewives groups. Um, so I did dabble in that a little bit, and then I moved on to the post office. So yes, that was my second big project as an academic. But why? I grew up in Japan, and I know what the I Japanese know. postal system is, but for our listeners who don't know why, why? Right. What fascinated you about the Japanese postal service? Well, you're right to ask why, because a lot of Americans, when I tell them I'm doing that, their response is, why on earth, why would you spend time on that? Uh, well, the short answer is that the Japanese post office is more than a place to mail a letter. And as I discovered for myself uh, when I lived in Japan, the post office is also a, a major sa a savings bank. And it's a place to buy life insurance. And it offers all kinds of services. And the postal savings system became so large by the 1990s that it earned the distinction of being the world's largest savings bank. That's my entry into this topic. And so by the time I was interested and had the time to move into this postal project, Koizumi Junichiro was becoming the Prime Minister of Japan in 2001. And his number one goal, and he had held this goal since the early 90s, was to privatize the post office, particularly the postal savings and insurance systems. For one, or two important reasons, and I'm summarizing things perhaps a little too uh, generally, but here they are. The first reason was that all that money that went into the postal savings system as deposits, household deposits, and the premiums to buy insurance policies were all channeled through first the post ministry and then into the Ministry of Finance, where the government decided where that money should be invested, and they would channel those postal proceeds through what's called the Fiscal Investment and Loan Program, or the FILP, into government financial institutions that in turn gave loans to various um, targeted recipients, targeted by government policy. So during the rapid growth period from roughly 1960 to the early, to mid, early 1970s, those funds were channeled into industry to help them achieve an edge in export markets, for example. And then after that, a variety of different projects um, gained ascendance. Um, FILP funds, i.e. postal savings and insurance funds, were helping local governments build roads and schools and parks. They were helping clean up the environment when environmental pollution was an issue. 
Um, now they're being channeled into in a, in a different way, but uh, now the felt is used to help small businessmen and uh, small businesses and other projects. So that use of household savings in a way that positioned the government to be a financial intermediary between savings and recipients really skewed the public financial system in Japan. And Koizumi wanted that changed. He wanted the postal system privatized in a way that would create a more level playing field between the postal system and commercial banks. The other reason he wanted to privatize it, and this was the political scientist in me getting really interested in the post office, is that the post office, or at least the usually men who ran it, 24,000 plus postmasters, um, were one of the largest vote mobilizing organizations for the Liberal Democratic Party through the post-war era. And their pressure on the LDP was largely responsible, or at least partially responsible in a very significant way, for keeping this whole financial network I described in place and immune to reform. And so Koizumi thought if we privatize the postal system, we weaken the postmasters as an electoral arm of the LDP that clamored on behalf of these traditional institutions that Koizumi thought should be relegated to Japanese history. They had no part in a mature economy. And so that's why I dived into the post office and discovered all kinds of interesting things along the way. I was just thinking about um, my own experience, a little bit personal experience, a little bit there of how the post postmaster um, was always a powerful figure in the community, right. but not in the I am running for office way, but more so in the you would see him at um, Undokai at uh, sports right. day <laughs> and you would see him at the summer um, festival at the Omatsuri and right. and everybody knew his wife for instance exactly. um, and it was so it's also so fascinating because in many many ways Japan is modern I grew up in a modern Japan and yet it's it's not you know when you I mean I grew up in a big suburb of Tokyo you know a, a, just like any big suburb right. in the United States but it was in certain ways um, very small community. That's exactly right. And the postmasters were in some, some communities central to all of this. What is interesting from a social and cultural perspective of the postal system is that the bulk of Japanese postmasters, although they were civil servants, at least before privatization legislation was passed in 2005, um, most of them that ran small post offices inherited their post offices from their fathers, their grandfathers, great-grandfathers, and so on. Some, some postmasters that I taught to trace the lineage of their post office back to the early Meiji period, the 1870s, and they were historical sites. So whereas most bureaucrats in Japan are forced to change their, their positions or their locale every three years, if they get billeted to one community, they get shifted out after three more years, and some of the postmasters of really large post offices, Futsuyu being Kyoku, or just regular post offices, would do just that. The postmasters in these Tokteyu being Kyokucho, or commissioned postmasters, or specially designated postmasters, would spend their entire lives in that job. And so did their fathers and their grandfathers and so on. So they had social stature. And they translated that stature into social capital that was used to not only bring business into the post office, but also to contribute to a sense of community. So yeah, these fellows were, they let, sometimes they headed the PTA, sometimes they, um, they coached children's soccer teams, as you noted. Um, they would host children in the post office on a field day and teach them letter writing and so on. Um, for decades in the mid 20th century, the post office was often the only locale of a village radio. And so people, when they heard the surrender speech of the Emperor of Japan in August of 1945, heard it sitting in the postmaster's office or home because that's where the radio was. So uh, a real center of community affairs and that in turn gets translated into political capital. So those postmasters would use their networks to gather the vote 
they wouldn't at election they wouldn't actually do it themselves because it was illegal for many decades uh, at least until 2005 when privatization was introduced they would um, mobilize their wives or their retired colleagues to do the job for them and so they became a really really powerful electoral arm of the LDP and as such, their social and political roles, as well as their role in mobilizing financial capital for the developmental state, make some really important figures of a very now traditional model of political, social, and economic development. And you saw all this through the post office. Yes, yes. So, like I said, the post office is more than just a place to mail a letter. And I think, too, that uh, those services, which are really convenient, imagine not only does the local post office, and there's one um, in every neighborhood, it's usually one post office within a child's walking distance was the word. There's not only a post office in your neighborhood, but the post office comes to you, particularly if you're older, and, and you can do the banking on your doorstep. That's incredible. So all of these services were so convenient. Um, and also the post office became, at least in the Meiji era, very much a symbol of, of modernization, of the state playing a positive role in bringing Japan into a new future. It was the trusted face of the state at the local level. So all of these dimensions of the post office combined to create I think a real love of the institution at the local level. People really love their post office in Japan. You can't say that so much about the U.S. post office. And that got translated into a lot of opposition in the 2000s to Koizumi's push to privatize the postal services. And as a result of it, although Koizumi did get his way, he passed his legislation with a lot of modification that was a nod, I think, to that those forces of resistance, as he called them. Um, but that legislation um, that was supposed to go online in 2007, the stipulations were postponed, and, and then eventually postal privatization legislation was reformed somewhat in 2012 to enable the government to retain a heavy footprint, I think, within the services. So it will never be fully privatized. I remember this, um, actually, the constant debate on the TV. It was right. definitely the privatization of the postal service was just always on the news. And it wasn't just a financial debate or a, even a political debate. It was a cultural conflict, a yeah. new Japan versus an old, warm and fuzzy traditional. This is what makes it this, us distinctive Japan. Very yeah. different. Because imagine, right? Imagine me as this, you know, typical kid in Japan. You mm -hmm. see your postal tantosha, the person in charge of her house. You kind of grow up with him, right? Because right. he comes to your house every single month, once a month, every day on either the 10th or the 15th or whatever day, you know, they designated would come. Right. And they see you go to um, elementary school, then congratulate you for, you know, being accepted to you, the high school that you wanted. And they saw me off, go to college in the United States. You know, when, Ko when Koizumi was first deliberating on this with his right-hand man on that, the Keio University economist, um, Takenaka Heizo, they debated, they, they had a vision at first of a really broad privatization that would, with some modification, turn the post offices into small businesses. And they eventually modified their goals and the postal blueprint that they put forward for legislation um, recognized that the, the network was important of those 24,000 or more post offices needed to be maintained and this was because of pushback from local areas and politicians representing underserved rural communities who were really worried that if privatized, a lot of post offices would go out of business and they'd shut down. Who's, how are the tantosha going to get to your mother's doorstep, if that's the case? And just that issue of what will happen to my local post office, will I still get the same service, the same face-to-face -face service? 
that drove a lot of the groundswell of opposition to what Koizumi wanted to do. I know you do uh, research on many topics that's beyond the post office. What are some other factors playing in Japan that caught your attention? Well, I was really sad when I finished my book. You know, on one hand, I was happy, don't get me wrong. You know, publishing a book is a lot of work and, and it drags on for so long. Um, so I was pleased to see it finished, but then sorry to see that, all right, that, that chapter in my life is closed. Will I ever find anyone as interesting as those postmasters? I really love the, the research. Um, and the answer is pretty much I did. I was really lucky. Um, I have been partnering with a University of Pittsburgh professor named Keishi Mizu, and we are writing, we've just finished a book actually, on agricultural reform of cooperatives or no-kyo within JA or Japan Agricultural Cooperatives. And much to my surprise, I found once again the uh, how embedded this network of co-ops is in local, this time rural society in particular, more so than the post office. And so a lot of the same themes came out um, for the, the story about agricultural cooperation um, and its reform. It's very hard to change these institutions that have been embedded in local society, society intermeshed with local networks for so many generations. You can't just privatize them. You can't just reform them. You can't just order them from on high to change the way they go about doing their thing. It doesn't work that way. Um, these aren't firms or corporations that are primed organizationally and, and in terms of their ideas that buttress them to simply change on a dime whenever prices in the market change. They are social institutions. They represent certain cultural values. They represent a state society approach to dealing with common affairs. Um, and to, to simply legislate them away is well nigh impossible. So um, I saw some very similar themes play out in the case of Japanese agriculture. Um, and then some also very new ones. So I got Whereas the post office was, uh, most of my research was done in urban and, and semi-urban areas, some trips into rural communities. Of course, the story of agriculture is a rural story. And so this time I saw a side of Japan that I didn't know very well before, and that is farmers, farm households, the noka, and the relationship with the local co-op. So there are a lot of interesting things to unearth, dig up. Um, on that project as well. And also the co-ops had uh, a similar feature to the post office and it's even much broader. So they provide services, they sell implements, seed, fertilizer, machinery to the farmer. They market the farmer's product. Um, they're multi-purpose. They also do the farmer's banking. So the JA, the network was also a bank, this time for farmers mostly. They also provided a whole gamut of services depending on the locality. Um, they, they ran gas stations, grocery stores, a co-op it it's called. They provide you know, wedding halls, uh, travel services. Um, some, some of them even had car sale networks or they would sell tombstones. They also did provided social welfare services for the elderly, elder care, home care workers. So it was a one-stop shop, a multi-service provider, um, which, and this sounds very much like what I saw with the post office, uh, really annoyed reformers who would like to see Japan um, be more market-oriented, but was also very much protected and defended by those who thought Japan has a more distinctive approach to economic and political development, that one that pays more attention to the costs on society. I'm also hearing a story of push and pull, right? Oh, this yes. is this is a country yes. that's, you know, after the war, really going through major transformation, and and it's not the first time. I mean, you know, when you look at the Japanese history, there's also a major a point of transformation during the Meiji era. One thing I would say though that the Meiji period and the post-war era and the post-war period, the occupation were two moments in history in which change was radical. But when I look back on the post-war period 
from 1952, let's say when the occupation is finished, Japan is now an independent country. And from 52 to today, in retrospect, yes, there's been a lot of change. But change is slow and incremental. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. Every once in a while, you get a Koizumi Junichiro who wants to speed things up um, for the postal system, or an Abe Shinzo who tried to do it for JA and the agricultural system. But for the most part, change is slow, one step at a time, and a lot of friction. And I think it has to do with the interconnectedness of these sectors of, of Japan, economic, social, political, cultural, and these institutions that embody all of that. Um, it's like untangling a skein of, of yarn. You, it, it, it's so enmeshed in so many different walks of Japanese life. You cannot target just one set of, of uh, say, service provisions um, without having to make complementary changes to the context of those um, services. And I love that you mentioned that because it is so true. There are certain changes that happen really rapidly, very few in Japan, I have to admit those moments. Um, but there are also really changes that happen very, very slowly. And that's why I think sometimes people think that rapid change in, only, in Japan is only possible from immense external pressure which was obviously true of Meiji period and of post-war. It's the Japanese way of, of going through change. It's not right or wrong, it's just the Japanese way. Um, and I find it fascinating that you really immersed yourself in there. It was a lot of fun, I'll tell you. When I was a grad student, my, I, as I mentioned, my first project was the consumer movement. And I went, into that topic, thinking that consumer activists would think like Ralph Nader in Japan, in the United States, excuse me, that there are businesses and there are consumers and the two shall conflict. But in Japan, consumer activists were far more conciliatory toward business, at least small business and farmers. They wanted, they, they aimed for a more holistic approach to serving the consumer interest. They didn't see a line in the sand between business versus consumers. They saw more, sometimes business strays and hurts us a little. We need to pull them back. But we're all in the same family, basically, and we need to learn how to cooperate. So even there, um, that, what's the word, adversarial approach to the political system of us versus them, um, was absent in the consumer story that I discovered. And all this in certain ways started with the kawaii piano. I guess you could say that I never would have dreamed that it would have gotten me where it has, the kawaii piano. <laughs> Which, by the way, I played just a few, oh, it was last summer when I was home in Vancouver, and the piano that we had in our house is still there. Oh, how beautiful. That is so wonderful. Patricia, I also have to ask, um, there are many people, young people especially, who are just about to start their journey, their Japan journey. What would you say to them? I, well, I have many things that I would want to say to them, and I think this is a great question, but let me focus on just one thing. In some of the organizations I belong to, We've worked very hard, including the um, Japan-U.S. Friendship Commission and CULCON, CULCON in particular, um, Japan-U.S. Conference on Cultural and Educational Interchange. That organization has worked so hard, along with the Bridging Foundation, those three organizations, to promote study abroad. And any young person thinking about going to Japan, I urge you to explore your institution's study abroad connections with Japan. It's a wonderful way to get there. Um, you can go as a tourist, of course, but study abroad, I have only great things to say about. I wished I had done it when I was an undergraduate, and I think that's a wonderful and very meaningful way of introducing yourself and immersing yourself into um, everyday Japan. And last but not least, if you could do it again, would you still go to Kitami, Hokkaido? Yes, I would. 
Yes, I would. <laughs> Although I will confess I don't want to paint too rosy a picture when I first got to Kitami and winter started at the end of September. I wasn't sure I would last two years, but I did, and I'm so glad I did because I had such a great experience and met so many terrific people. Thank you so much, Patricia. That was such a beautiful, beautiful Japan journey. Well, thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Support for My Japan Journey comes from the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership and the Toshiba International Foundation. To learn more about the Japan Society of Boston and our guest speakers, or to find the transcript of each episode, please visit our website at www.japansocietyboston.org forward slash podcast. My Japan Journey is produced by the Japan Society of Boston and edited by Lucy Jones. Our theme music is These Times by Blue Dot Sessions, and additional music is composed and performed by Pianimo.